Hello and welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. When you're ready to launch your next app or want to try a project you hear about on the show, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so take a look at our friends over at Linode. With 200 gigabit private networking, scalable shared block storage, node balancers, and a 40 gigabit public network, all controlled by a brand new API, you've got everything you need to scale up. And for your tasks that need fast computation, such as training machine learning models, they just launched dedicated CPU instances. And they also have a new object storage service to make storing data for your apps even easier. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash linode, that's L-I-N-O-D-E today, to get a $20 credit and launch a new server in under a minute. And don't forget to thank them for their continued support of this show. And you listen to this show to learn and stay up to date with the ways that Python is being used, including the latest in machine learning and data analysis. For even more opportunities to meet, listen, and learn from your peers, you don't want to miss out on this year's conference season. We have partnered with organizations such as O'Reilly Media, Corinium Global Intelligence, ODSC, and Data Council. Upcoming events include the Software Architecture Conference, the Strata Data Conference, and PyCon US. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash conferences to learn more about these and other events, and take advantage of our partner discounts to save money when you register today. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Ivan Kravets about Platform.io, an open source ecosystem for IoT development, including a cross-platform IDE, unified debugger, remote unit testing, and firmware updates. So Ivan, can you start by introducing yourself? Yes. So hey, everybody. Tobias, thank you so much for hosting me at your podcast. My name is Ivan, and I am from Ukraine, and I'm the founder of the Platform.io project where currently I'm responsible for different aspects of this project. It's the business size, architecture, marketing, and sometimes even technical support. Uh, I'm also a teacher uh, in the past and spent around 10 years in the web development. This is the backend plus the front end, where I mainly use PHP language. And do you remember how you first got introduced to Python? Uh, yes, it was 2012 year. Uh, no, no, no one introduced me to the Python. I actually moved to the new house and uh, I spent a lot of time for home, home automation and I used different hardware in the home. And uh, I had the problem to manage all these different devices because they use different uh, network, uh, network interfaces. And I looked actually for the network driven asynchronous framework and I found Twisted and this is actually how I met first time the Python. It was the Twisted engine. And have you taken a look at all at Home Assistant or were you involved in the home automation before that project was even started? Yes, it was 2012 a year. I don't remember how we had a Home Assistant in this time. But uh, the whole thing which I did in the 2012, it was actually to create the bridge between the hardware and actually the home assistant. And the project was named like Smart Anhill. I spent uh, two years for this project. And this is actually the place where the platform IO was born. Because uh, Smart Anhill project, this is high level abstraction on top of on the hardware and the home assistant can actually communicate with the smart handheld using this API interface. And the platform I was to use here, here just to deploy a special firmware or we call this operating system to the different devices where a end developer who will work with smart handheld project will actually communicate with the network device. And it doesn't matter uh, which type of network the end device will use the smart angel emulate one type of connection and one type of uh, interface. And so were you dealing with things like Ethernet and Zigbee radios and 900 megahertz band and all these different types of interfaces that you're trying to abstract yes, across? Yes, yes, you're right, you're right. So I even <clears throat> I even called smart angel, smart angel like heterogeneous network. So where you can connect different devices, even devices without connectivity. I mean that you can connect your where 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 a simple constraint device through the uh, ser serial interface and uh, actually when you will work with the smart angel you will work with the device which will look for you like a network you can even ping this device you will have special address of this device but but uh, on the hardware layer this is not the ne networking device 
So you you had the uh, dubious pleasure of being able to try and make RS-232 usable. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And did you have much of a background in hardware engineering and dealing with these different embedded platforms prior to trying to build this home automation platform? Or is this something that you just learned as you got involved with it? Yes, this is, this is really the funny, but I am not an electronic engineer. So I created this, but I mean, I founded Platform.io and I am not professional or professional embedded engineer. And I think this is the main or the key success of the Platform.io because I don't look on the Platform.io from this hardware or embedded square. I don't have these limits. I look from the perspective where I can build amazing user experience for the developers. Because when I mentioned before that I say that I spent 10 years for web development. And when I worked with uh, web tools, they look for me really cool because you can press one button, you can do debugging, you can, for example, press to run script, you will receive the result. And if we talk about the hardware, about the embedded, this is a really complicated step. Even trying to do debugging, you need to know a lot of different complex things, not saying how to configure them, but you actually need to understand how these things work. And... Uh, I actually, with the platform IO, learned a lot of things and went to the embedded um, together with the platform IO. And so can you give a bit of a description about what platform IO is now and some of the different features that it has and how it helps to simplify the work of interacting with and developing for these different embedded platforms? Yes, as I already mentioned before, the problem is to flash or to program this device. The platform IO is the open source tool. And sometimes I even call it like the Swiss knife because with the platform IO, you could be focused on the code writing and you can actually just explain platform IO, what is the type of your hardware. And the same when you press run, but run button in your ID to run Python script, the same you do with the platform IO. You press like, hey platform, please flash these three boards. And before this, you will just explain platform IO. I have the board A, it's based on the architecture ARM, for example. I have the board B, it's based on the architecture X5. Or I have three three boards and sort of them is based on the AVR. And you ask platform IO, please build my project in Flash all, all these boards. And platform IO now resolve all this complexity automatically for you. So it knows which tool chain to use because you know that for for this three different architectures, you actually need to use three different tool chains. And if we talk about different frameworks or SDK, you also need to know how to link your software. I mean, your project with this frameworks, you need to write some build scripts or similar to that. But with platform IO, you don't need to do to do this because before before adding a new hardware or new new development key to the platform IO, we already provide full detailed information about this device and we know how to do building, how to do uploading, how to do debugging or how to do unit testing or how to do code static analyzing and different, different aspects. Mainly when people work with the platform IO, they even don't know which tool chain do we use or how do we compile code. And, and I think this is the best what we uh, could achieve with the platform IO. Because now developers, companies, they could be focused on the code writing and on the getting result in, in a days, not in a weeks. So no need to spend just one week to learn how to program this board, read long, long list uh, data sheets, no need to do this. And so you mentioned that the original inspiration for building platform IO was just trying to solve your own problem of getting all these different devices in your home to be able to talk to each other. And so what was your motivation for deciding to continue working on it and developing it as a product and then building a business around it? Yes. So the main motivation was just to save my time because platform IO wasn't created like the project, like the business project. It was the hobby project. And if this is the hobby project, I, ha I had a limited time to work as on my uh, hobby projects, like the smart handheld, which I mentioned before. And you know that the main motivation was to save my time. So I don't want to spend yet another week to learning how to program yet another hardware. I remember that night, it was 2012 year, I had three different boards on my table and I, and I used three different ideas. 
So one, one I do to program Arduino board. The second I use uh, R embed. Today is R embed, but before it was embed a project, I use their online ID to program this board. And the third, I have Texas Instruments uh, Code Composer Studio to program the, their launchpad, uh, launchpad device. So and actually the problem, every time when I back to my uh, habit project, I should spend 10, 20 or 30 minutes just to remember what I did before. Every time I lost the time and this uh, was the time on remember the context of the previous uh, steps on which I stopped. So, and uh, the main motivation for the platform was to support hybrid configuration where I can easily add new hardware and no matter on the which type of architecture this hardware will be built or on the which, uh, which type of framework my project will be built. So the goal was to, to have one universal instrument or tool which will do this work automatically for me. And one of the interesting things that has been a recurring theme in talking to people who start a project as a reason for facilitating a particular hobby is that they never actually end up completing the initial reason that they were starting on this other side project. So for instance, I know that Glyph, who created Twisted, built it because he wanted to have it as a component for building a video game, which he never mm. completed. So I'm wondering if you ever actually ended up finishing uh, your home automation project or if you got too sidetracked into platform IO and now you've got some half implemented home automation platform. Actually, I stopped a work on the Smart Town Hill project uh, and I focused just on the, on the platform IO because platform IO was really small uh, puzzle in the Smart Town Hill. And I thought that Platform IO is a very easy uh, project, but it's it's really complex. It's already had took it's six years, six years for us and a lot, a lot, a lot of work. But why I am super, super happy that the Platform IO wasn't start as a business project. And it means that we were not focused on the money. I mean, that we, we had a time to talk with the customers. We talked with the user. I spent a lot of time uh, go into the end user machines where I wanted to learn how users work now, which tools do they use, why they decided to try platform IO, which features are missed in the platform. IO. I mean that this, this first two or three years, they were great for the platform IO because we could get this market adoption, we finally realized which problems we resolve. And uh, now is yet another, uh, how to correct say, is another level within the platform you know, where we are going to the enterprise market. And this experience, which we got from the makers, uh, makers world, we are super happy to repeat with this uh, enterprise market because we need to do the same. You know that in, in the enterprise market, there are also yet another tools and they tools, these tools are different. Most of them are closed source. Most of them are paid. And actually for the enterprise companies, there is no problem to pay for these uh, tools. And even if our tools are cool or free, it's very difficult to uh, convince some managers to use platform. Here. And again, they need to need to learn, need to understand what is missing the platform. I mean, a lot, a lot of work again for us now. And what are some of the aspects of embedded development that keep you interested and engaged in this space of the developing for these different types of hardware? And what are some of the types of projects that somebody might use platform IO to be able to build? <laughs> to be honest, I don't do a lot of embedded programming uh, today. As I mentioned before, I moved from the uh, web world. And in this world, developer, develop, developers are mostly focused on the code writing or the code writing. And as I mentioned before, they don't want to spend these hours to get the result. Embedded world is really complex. And every day for me, just to improve the user experience, to simplify these complex things, which I mentioned before, like tool chains ma management, build scripts, uh, moving between different host machines. It's really the crazy problem. And the last really, really big problem is that the companies uh, which work on the hardware project, there is the problem for them to find a really skilled embedded engineer. 
And the goal of the platform IO is to allow these companies to hire just high level professional C++ developers and no need from them to be skilled electronic engineers. I mean that if we have some uh, gener generic team, no need to have 100% of super skilled electronic engineers. With the platform IO, we can have one or two engineers, for example, and eight or 10 just super talented C++ developers who can read uh, API of the operating system or who can do classic things uh, which uh, they did before the embedded world where they would like to be focused just on the code writing. They just want to press some button to do debugging or, or unit testing and they don't have time or and don't want to learn all these complex things from the embedded sites. And in the time since you first began working on Platform.io, I know that there's been a lot of renewed interest in embedded systems development and hardware hacking, and there have been different projects that have tried to bring higher level languages to those platforms for at least hobbyist projects. And I'm wondering how the overall evolution of the space has impacted the direction that you're going with platform IO and some of the focus that you've put into it as far as what problems you're trying to solve. I think that the most important what the most important thing which happened for the last years is that the finally uh, semiconductor companies uh, have started looking uh, into the onto the open source community. So you see a lot of news where different companies open source their real time operating system. This is the first. The second, uh, if you if you take a look at the embedded market, most of IDs are based on the Eclipse. And today, these cheap vendors they finally realized that the new generation developers they would like to have something much better than the Eclipse, which has uh, a lot of different features capable for installing new plugins easy for extending. And there are a lot, a lot, a lot of internet things which change for the six, for the six years. And the third problem, oh, sorry, the third uh, things, which is very important for the last years, as this is the Arduino ecosystem, because you know that before 2017, most of us uh, looked on the Arduino like on the natural and open source ecosystem. But you know that after that time when uh, ARM acquired Arduino, we have the problem with the Arduino today because uh, all of their new hardware, uh, they are mainly based on the ARM and all of their new tools, they are fully closed, fully source closed and even paid. So, and this is a really big problem for us because we spent first three years, we like so much Arduino and we spent three years for the Arduino just to try uh, to improve this ecosystem, to provide more advanced tools for developers who need uh, more advanced instruments. And now we're actually in the, in the stage where we are looking to add more different frameworks to our ecosystem. So today we have support for around 20 different frameworks and SDK and Arduino, this is just the small puzzle in our ecosystem today. So for engineers who are building software for these different embedded platforms, what are some of the common challenges that they might encounter? And how does the complexity of dealing with multiple different hardware targets influence the way that they might design and implement their software? So the problem is actually starting from the semiconductor vendor so when when you when you start your project with some hardware the cheap vendor locks you just to this hardware because if you go to the website of this uh, cheap vendor you will see that this vendor recommends using their uh, special tool or id and for you it's very the big problem if you decide to move from this vendor vendor ecosystem to something new. For example, if tomorrow there is new MCU, which is much, much better in comparison with the MCU which you use today, you will have a lot of problem if you want to switch to this competitive MCU because it's the, it's the different SDK or different framework. You need to install yet another ID. You need to learn how to work with that. And this is, this is actually the big problem. And the platform IO 
is fully agnostic to the architecture of the MCU. And our customers no need to worry which hardware or which board they use, because for them, it looks like a change in just a one line in the configuration file. So let's, let's imagine the same. If tomorrow we have the better MCU or the better hardware, our customer will just change this line. Like my new development kit is something new, platform IO, please build. And you don't need to do any change in your project. You can use your favorite ID. You can use your, your favorite operating system. You don't need to move, for example, to the Windows if, for, if, as if a chip vendor supports only Windows. You can use, you can use any operating system, any ID. You actually have full freedom. You personally decide how your development environment will look for you. And what is very interesting is that the only platform you allow developers to use different operating system and work on the, the same project. So let's imagine that someone preferred to use Mac OS and Eclipse. The second preferred to use Windows and Visual Studio Code. And the third engineer preferred to use Command Line and Vim. All of them work on the, the same project. The configuration is located in the one on the one file called platformio.ini. No other configuration. Without the platform, for example, if you use classic tools, uh, which we have today in the embedded market, the whole configuration is, 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 lo is located directly in the ID. So if you do one change in this ID, you need to ask your colleague to repeat the same. Like you add new build flags or you do some change to the debugging, you need to explain other uh, colleague to repeat uh, this step. I even don't uh, say how many problems you will have if you try to move this project to another host machine, Linux or car size PC. With the platform, I don't know this problem because as I mentioned before, all these problems were resolved with the smart uncle because these problems were for the smart uncle like a number top of one. Because with, within the smart uncle, we, we just explain what is our hardware and it doesn't matter which operating system you will use, even car size PC. And so for somebody who is using platform IO for being able to work on one of these projects, can you talk through the overall workflow of getting started and setting it up and specifying what types of libraries you need and the different hardware platforms that you're targeting? So uh, it's today it's, it's very easy to get started with Embedded because you can go to the platformio.org website. We recommend to get started from the Visual Studio Code uh, extension. We have official platform IO extension for the Visual Studio Code. We'll just download Visual Studio Code, go to the extension section, search for platform IO ID, press install button, and finish. You will see platform IO home, a really nice interface, which will ask you about your hardware. You select your hardware, select your framework, it could be Arduino, and you can start uh, writing simple project like Blink or Hello, similar to Hello World and Board Flash. No need to install any tool, tool chains manually. No need to learn how to write the build script. Nothing. Just, just need to be focused on the source code writing and read some, some uh, guides <clears throat> how to do embedded development. So it's 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 very easy with the platform IO. So can you talk through a bit about how the platform IO ecosystem is actually implemented and some of the different components that comprise it and just how some of the overall system design has evolved since you first began working on it? Yes, it's really good, a good question. So if we talk about the smart on, smart on, so the number one reason why Python was uh, used is the twisted. And if we talk about the platform IO, this is again the rise number one number one uh, package or library which we love so much. And this is this is scones or scones. I don't know what is the correct pronunciation. So the scones is super cool. It's amazing. So it could be used like a build system. So you can use it like the replacement for make or C make build system. But the magic side of the scans is that you can use it like a library. So the scans is the heart of the platform IO. The whole things which we have with the build, build workflow with the, the platform IO, we do it on the top of the scans. So we extended the scans with our interfaces. We, cr we created this unified interface for multiple different development platforms. And all and now this separated development platform, we call it like 
for AVR or for ARM or for other architecture, just communicate with the Platform.io core API and explain, hey, Platform.io, I have this source code. I would like to use this flags to build C++ type files, this flags for our assembly files. I would like to do a linking process or something in this way. The upload process should, should look in this way. And we call this things like decentralized architecture. It means that if we take a look at the platform your core, there is nothing common with, with any architecture. It's fully agnostic to any architecture. And you can easily integrate any hardware and any architecture to the platform IO. No need to do any, any contribution to the platform IO core from this side. It's very easy to create your own development platform for your hardware and just reuse whole, po whole power of the platform IO. And the main benefits is that using this very simple interface, you will just explain within your development platform how to do building, debugging, and other things. And your hardware is automatically integrated into our 10 different ideas. The Eclipse, Visual Studio Code, uh, Qt, C-Line, a lot, a lot of them. Because you don't need to spend again your time to create extension for these ideas. We already did this. If your hardware is integrated to the platform IO, your customers automatically receive this huge list of ideas. Your customer can use any operating system, Mac, Linux, Windows, FreeBSD, even car size PC. Your customers can test their project with different continuous integration services. They can use different static tools uh, for static analysis. They can e easily do debugging even if they don't know how to do it because they will just select the type of debugging pro, press the debugging button, and they will be the main function. And you mentioned that SCONS is the sort of core reason that Platform.io is built around Python, but if you were to start the entire project over today, are there any things that you would do differently in terms of the overall design or project focus or the implementation language? I think everything, uh, everything was done uh, correct and and if we even back uh, to the platform of your core history, uh, we haven't had any change since, since 2016. So we, the architecture uh, which, were, which were implemented in uh, 2016 uh, were not changed today. The only, the only one things uh, which uh, we may, maybe would like to change this is the mistake that we were focused on the Arduino. And today, if you try to talk with someone and you will ask, have you heard about the platform IO? Most of people will, will say, yes, we know this is like replacement for the Arduino and amazing tool for, for the makers. And this is actually the problem for us because most of people look on the platform IO like for the replacement for the Arduino or for the tool for the makers. And it makes the problem for us if we try to move to the enterprise market and to have support for this uh, low level frameworks, hardware abstraction library and SDKs. Because most people think that the platform is just only for the makers uh, world, but that is not true. So the, I think this is the only one things which or seem to miss a mistake, I don't know. It would, it would, it could be really great if we, from the first year or already started support different frameworks, not only Arduino. And so beyond the development of the software for these different platforms, there's also the concern of verifying that what you're building is actually going to work. So things like unit testing, and you mentioned debugging, and I'm, so I'm wondering, what are some of the challenges in the embedded software space for being able to handle those aspects of the software development lifecycle and some of the ways that platform IO helps in that effort? Yes. So, you know, if you, if you do debugging, for example, if you do debugging of Python application, this is, this is not a, a so complex, uh, technical task because you do this work on the host machine, but if we talk about the hardware debugging, unit testing we should do on the hardware and you know that hardware is very constrained it's very limited if we call if we say about the host machine the gigabytes of ram and and if we talk about uh, embedded embedded device this is kilobytes of ram and also sometimes even kilobytes of flash and you can't upload some complex testing framework to this device and you can't do some crazy complex uh, debugging on this device 
And in this case, if you try to do this uh, manually, it's a little bit difficult because you do, you need to uh, you need to create some bridge interface to communicate with this device. But with platform AO, it's very easy because we have some abstraction based on top of Unity framework. It's the C++ framework. And you can actually use the same workflow which you use, which you use for the Python. You can write uh, your unit tests. They look uh, very similar to the Python uh, unit uh, testing workflow. And the same, you will just press a uh, test button and Platform.io will uh, compile your source code, deploy to the end device, gather results, analyze results, and just present you some feedback with results on your host machine. You can even do this uh, using platform your remote service. So it means that you can work with your hardware or deploy uh, remote deploy tests to a remote device, which is not actually connected to your machine. Let's imagine that you have some device, for example, a Raspberry Pi or similar to that. You connect some, some uh, embedded devices, so the cable or or so the Wi-Fi, and you can you can work with these devices from anywhere in the world, and you can deploy this unit test or similar to that, or flashes board or other the air updates, and no need to be connected directly to this uh, device. And the big benefits of the platform your remote that you don't need to open any SSH or other ports uh, to your remote machine. The Rise platform your broker which resolve these problems automatically for both ends. And one of the other complexities with deployment, particularly in these embedded systems, is what happens when something goes wrong. And so being able to prevent that from being the case or for cases where maybe you're trying to deliver remotely over the network, where there might be some issues with corruption of the data in transit or where the network might drop out before the flashing operation is completed. And so I'm wondering, what are some of the guards that you have in place or some best practices? for people who are working in the space to prevent that type of problem from happening? So there, there are actually like like two, ty two types of uh, thermal f flash in which you mentioned. So the first, you can flash your device using hardware uh, interface through the USB, USB cable. Or the second uh, option is to deploy firmware through the air, like out the air updates. So all of these uh, operations, they are... Uh, fully different because in the case with uh, with the usb it depends on the upload protocol and upload tool most of them uh, uh, most of them have built-in uh, different uh, mechanism which uh, mechanisms which verify deployed firmware on the target device before flashing but in case with our the air updates uh, the end developers should personally implement uh, these things on the end device. So the flash, which is on the on the device, it should be split it is minimum into two parts. So one bank is for, for example, for the working firmware, and the second bank for the uh, update, uh, which is coming through the our the air channel. And if you, for example, if you, I mean. If the firmware has not been uh, downloaded correctly, you will not change some special flag within your bootloaders that new firmware is ready. It means that if you if you deployed seventy percent of your firmware for the end devices, it's not one hundred percent, and this firmware will not be accepted. I mean, it's not it's not a problem. I mean, this is this is the response this is the responsibility of uh, the developer who will implement this. Different, different, different embedded devices uh, requires different uh, approaches how to do this. And in the platform IO remote, do you also have a facility for being able to track inventory of the different devices that you have out in the field and the version of the firmware that they're running so that you can see what you have and what still needs to be updated and maybe be able to handle some of those failed deployments by seeing that, oh, this still hasn't been updated. I need to retry the delivery. Mm -hmm. So platform your remote actually emulates everything what you do in your host machine. So if if you can, let's imagine that this, this device is connected to your machine. If you can check from your device the version or different things, 
you can do this the same with the platform IO uh, remote. So this is not like a um, device management system. This is actually uh, the tool which allow you to do the same what you do on your desktop machine. So if you can flash your device or you can uh, connect to the serial port uh, to the end device which is connected on your machine, you can do the same operation with the device which is connected to the remote machine. If you, if you provide some information from the serial interface which will uh, return some information about the firmware version, you will receive the same if you, if you try to connect to this device uh, from the platform your remote. And so in terms of the projects that you've seen people build using platform IO, what have been some of the most interesting or unexpected or innovative uses of the platform? So there are, there are a lot of interesting projects built not on top of this using platform IO. I think the most of the most interesting of them is this is ESP urna. I don't know what's the correct name because a lot of interesting projects are built on top of the espresso board and there is the espresso company and it uh, has very interesting MCU which has on board Wi-Fi. Also there is very interesting project called Marlin. So they created a universal firmware for different different 3D printers. It means that anyone can download their firmware, select the type of uh, the main controller in the printer and tune this printer, tune configuration. And there is also ESP, ESP, ESP Home project. Uh, it's very interesting library because it could be used in pair with the Home Assistant. So you install the Home Assistant, you will use this ESP Home library, flash your device, and you can easily manage your home embedded devices with Home Assistant. And in terms of your own experience of building platform IO and working in this embedded hardware space, what have been some of the most interesting or unexpected or challenging lessons that you've learned in the process? I think that uh, the most interesting things when, when we try to add support for some new SDK or operating system. The last time I remember we added support for Zephyr real-time operating system. And it was really uh, a really interesting case for us because Zephyr uh, is based on CMake uh, generator tool. And uh, we finally decided to not use uh, static code building. It means not to provide uh, static flags for building the source code. And we actually communicate uh, with CMake uh, generator tool and uh, we can provide the same build, build workflow which you will receive if you will use make or other uh, build tool so it's really interesting because the final project is it final project is final project is compatible with the platform io and also you can use it with the standalone cmake tool and in terms of sustainability of the platform io project and the business that you've built around it what is the overall business model and how are you approaching things like project governance so that people aren't uh, driven away by the perception of platform io uh, kind of governing the entire process and not really taking community feedback and just the overall community and ecosystem that you've been able to build up around it Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a really good, good question. So we actually, we actually had the problem with this because as I mentioned before, the platform IO was a hobby project for me and uh, I didn't think that it will be so, so much popular. And uh, when I uh, started work full time on the platform IO, it was 2016 year. I hoped that uh, cheap vendors companies, they will be interested in things what we do because uh, our tools are open source, they are free, developers are super happy, but uh, it was really a wrong way. And uh, I, I remember the time I even created the post in our community forums and actually asked people what to do next, because it was the, it was actually, it was the, the time where I thought what to do is the platform, I go to full-time work and again back platform you know, like the hobby project or continue to work on that and in 20 in 2017 we added a few interesting features to the platform you know, and made them paid so uh, a lot of people supported us and actually we are super thankful to them because they helped us to survive 
And the previous year, 2018 years was really cool for the platform. We finally made again platform fully open source and fully free thanks to the Western digital, digital company and the sci-fi. So they help us to make all the things free, even the platform are remote. And uh, the second, uh, the second part, part of our business model, we provide consulting to companies which use uh, platform IO for their project. And also there is new, new direction in our, uh, uh, in our business. We work so close with semiconductor companies and help help them to save a lot of not only financial resources but also the time resources. Because if you cheap vendor and you would like to introduce into the market yet another chip, you know you you will need to spend a lot of resources to create yet another ID and to provide the interface how to work with this uh, hardware. Normally, it will take you six months or even the year but but with the platform io it it can take you days not even not even not even weeks or months the previous week uh, i posted in our social network a really interesting use case where a chinese company uh, integrated their uh, processors into the platform io in two days so two days and they receive full future really professional id and they not only save save uh, time and resources they already have working solution for their customers so they can personally decide which id to use which operating system to use and this is really the great the great use case and what do you have planned for the future of the platform io project so uh i don't look on the platform io like on the project for the one year or two for me platform io uh, this is the project for the years and my final goal is to see platform IO everywhere. This is similar, similar to the Linux, where today Linux, the mainstream operating system. This is actually the same. So if we talk, if we talk from the end developer perspective, there is the huge problem in this market embedded. Because if you have 10 different hardware on your table, you will need to install 10 different IDs. Every time you need to switch between these IDs, not matter. Even even if this Eclipse, you need to have ten different Eclipses with different plugins. And Platform IO is unique solution and unique solution for these problems because we can have one ecosystem and one environment and one, one development tool for thousand different arch- uh, MCUs and uh, development boards. This is actually the goal. It's not. It's not. The, it's not only win, win, win solution for the developers, but it's also the win-win solution for manufacturers. Because let's imagine uh, if you if you are super talented in creating uh, new hardware, you actually buy the MCU from cheap vendor, and you will be in the position where you you will need to provide some uh, interface to program your hardware and you have a few options or you will try to invest in your own software and your own id or you will try to contact a chip vendor and ask uh, please add a supper of my custom hardware to your id and the last step it doesn't work so in the platform platform is actually a win-win solution for developers for manufacturers and for chip vendors too because all all of them will be focused on the one software tool for this hardware products are there any other aspects of the work that you've done on platform io or your experience of working in the embedded hardware ecosystem or any of your overall experience in general of building and maintaining an open source project that we didn't discuss that you'd like to cover before we close out the show no, I think everything is covered. All right. Well, for anybody who wants to get in touch with you or follow along with the work that you're doing, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And with that, I'll move us into the picks. And this week, I'm going to choose a brief article that I read recently about some research being done at the University of Massachusetts Amherst about being able to harness electricity just from the humidity in the air by using these protein nanowires connected up to an electrode. So some pretty remarkable work being done and pretty exciting to think about some of the different ways that it can be applied. So I'll add a link to that in the show notes. And with that, I'll pass it to you, Ivan. Do you have any picks this week? Yeah. So 
I actually would like to share my short experience with the platform IO. So I think that uh, the one really great advice advice from uh, my side is to not to be strictly focused on the money side of your project if you start to work on that, because business this is this is not about the money. This is the about the processes, about the management of the processes, and the money is actually the mark of your uh, of your results. And if you try to work on your uh, own project, I would really recommend to contact with every every one customer. Go to their machine using remote tools. Learn more which competitive tools do they use. Ask about why do they use. Don't think that you will waste this time. This time is very well, very well, well, very valuable. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today to join me and discuss your experience of building and maintaining and using the Platform IO project and working in this embedded hardware ecosystem. It's definitely an interesting and challenging space, and I'm glad to see that there are people like you who are out there trying to make it simpler. So thank you for all of your efforts on that front, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, too, for your time and for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to check out our other show, The Data Engineering Podcast, at dataengineeringpodcast.com for the latest on modern data management. And visit the site at pythonpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. And if you've learned something or tried out a project from the show, then tell us about it. Email hosts at podcastinit.com with your story. To help other people find the show, please leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends and coworkers.